it's a good thing to help people not apply for jobs they're not going to get. That's actually the best candidate experience of the lot. I used to have this discussion with Jerry Crispin at the Candies. I'd say, you know what the best experience is, Jerry? What? You don't apply for a job you're not going to get. Because anything, the not, if you apply for a job not getting the job, anything below getting the job is a suboptimal experience. Let's be honest, right? So I think, you know, but at least in this way, we're able to, we're able to help more people uh, get a better shot at the title for want of a better word. And we're also then able to use that data to slow down advertising when we reach those critical mass of people that we know the client needs to make the hire. So we can save people then applying for the job that they're not gonna get. Today's conversation is with Shane Gray of Glide Talent. Now some of you know Shane because he was one of the founders of Clinch. Now, after that exit, he went in-house to head a TA team of his own before jumping out and joining Glide Talent as, as one of the founders. Now, what I love about Shane is that he is everything I want a vendor to be. Yes, he knows his product. Yes, he knows the problem it's solving. Yes, he's charming as hell. It, you can't help it, right? What he brings to the table is perspective. Having talked to so many people in TA as one of the founders of Clinch, he really understands the big picture. He understands the problems people are trying to solve. He understands all the different tool sets. He understands candidates. He understands motivations. He really has great perspective, and that's why I invited him on. So I really hope you enjoy this conversation with Shane Gray. So with me is Shane Gray. Now I've known Shane for a little while here, about five or six years, and he has always been the guy who says not just what he thinks, but he speaks truth to power. He is not in any way, shape or form embracing this is how we're supposed to do it. He seems to always be thinking about why are we doing it this way? And that's why I wanted to have him on the show. So Shane, for everybody else's benefit who doesn't know you and doesn't know you through Clinch or any of their other projects, can you introduce yourself? Certainly. Thank you, James. So hello, everyone. I'm Shane Gray. I've been in the HR technology space for about 10 years now, which probably explains why I didn't know anything when I first started. I had no idea of how recruitment worked. I'd never applied for a job. I didn't even know what a hiring manager was, didn't know what an RPO was. So that was probably part of the, oh, why do you do it this way? But the journey's taken me through a bunch of roles now. I so was from the founding team at Clinch where I first met James, and then more recently to chief talent officer at Shift Fillers, which is a light industrial staffing business. And then currently my focus is on a top of the funnel recruitment automation solution called Glide, where I'm a co-founder and I run the operation side of things. So that's, that's my background in a nutshell. And when I didn't know anything about recruitment, and even when we were building Clinch as a product, we did understand human behavior and everyone used to go, you know, recruitment is sales, recruitment is marketing. It's not, it's recruitment is human behavior. And once you understand human behavior, you can do any of those three things. Yep. And, and that's the thing, you know, I, and I'm a big fan of clinch. I remain a big fan of clinch. Uh, you probably know that. Uh, what I liked about clinch is that it said, everybody is doing it in a agency model. Hey, we're going to build this website. And every time you want to make a change, you have to call us and pay us 150 or 200 bucks an hour. And we'll make the change for you. Cause you're just TA or you're just HR. And, how could you possibly know how to do these, this web tool? And Clinch said, no, no, I'm putting all the power in your hands. You want to make a change, you make a change. You want to change the font, go for it. You want to change the color, go for it. You want to add new pages, click, 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 you're done. And I thought that sense of bringing agency to talent acquisition was such a shift, right? Everything seems to be about how do we pull agency and power away from talent acquisition? How do we squeeze them? How do we optimize mm -hmm. them? How do we turn them into automatons to just do the basics? Clinch has a, had such a great point of view that said, no, let's let recruiters and employer branders speak more directly to the people they want to talk to. Was that like intentional from the jump or was that something you found as you went along? I think a little bit of it came from we had, we, and again, genuinely, the, you know, the founding team, none of us really had, had understood much about recruitment, let alone recruitment marketing. We did understand a bit about things like HubSpot and stuff like that. We did understand, and we were very lucky. I think Google gave us a, a pass into one of their startup economics forums, and we were lucky enough to meet Dan Ariely and people like that. And oh, I wow. think we started to think a lot about, uh, you know, why I, and again, I had a, a prior sort of involvement in an enterprise software company, and it was, the, the the founder there was really interesting. He always would go, what is the root cause of the problem here? And uh, and not knowing much about recruitment, uh, I started, you know, I read a lot. And actually, that might have been in a weird way. Never having applied for a job meant I didn't have any preconceived conceptions about what it was like. So I did actually spend extra amount of time trying to, I read scientific papers written by people about students applying for jobs. I spoke to people. 
I think what I started to realize was that there seemed to, the root cause, if, and I think it's still there, it's going to get solved, I think, over the coming years very quickly, is there's a lack of information flow between an employer and a candidate or an applicant and an applicant and an employer. 100% and agree. It's, and it really is like, and, and, I, and I think, and, and the recruiters sadly have become saddled with becoming the, with becoming the problem solver of that, uh, of that information flow and everything roots through them. Mm -hmm. And they're a bottleneck, sadly, and it's not their fault because you, how can you deal with a thousand people applying for a job and then, you know, a hundred, uh, you know, hiring managers roaring at you to try and get the role filled. So they're the bottleneck. So we thought that if we could make it easier for a recruitment team to get information on a web page in a manner that somebody could consume no fancy chat bots and stuff like that that it would be a good thing to do that we could help lubricate that flow of information between both sides so what the the candidate got more information because it was on the screen interestingly what the employer got was they got behavioral information they got to see oh shane's really interesting he's been on the web page five times or he's not interesting he's come in and he's left straight away and he's never come back again so they got a little bit of information as well so it was a kind of like a fair exchange of information between both sides of the equation but again getting that tool then and enabling the ta teams to use it and get the content that they had because you know you know the world of employer branding it's, you know, there's a lot of amazing content that gets created out there and it doesn't see the light of day. And that's the yeah. sad, the sad reality of it. So yeah. getting this career side element into a TA team's hands was really powerful in terms of enabling them to tell a better story. Did you find that TA teams, when they started to get this kind of data, oh, piece of content X is performing very well and that everybody wants to look at it, but nobody actually applies versus piece of content Y is very, very low traffic, but every single person who sees it seems to race straight to the application process. Did you see TA teams actually use this data or did I they tend it. Okay. Yeah. Like yeah a little. Bit. Yeah. Go ahead. A little. Not as much as we would have liked. And we were yeah. looking at how we could automate more of getting the right content. Cause you know, prior to, you know, we, we exit clinches, you know, I sit on for a period of time, then I left and I took on the role of, uh, of a chief talent officer in a, a light industrial startup. I said, I'll, I'll do, I'll get my hands dirty. I'll be the practitioner this time. And I, and I bought clinch as a product and I used it and I still loved lots of the parts of it. But I also saw as well, I guess with the now through the lens of a practitioner, I certainly saw some of the things that, you know, we were asking people to do were not actually that easy and I'm pretty technical. So I think some of those things we saw a lot of our clients doing them, but again, some of them probably needed something just a little bit more automated just to get the job done because they were getting hauled in five different ways. And in recruitment, it always boils down to delivery, right? If there's somebody screaming for somebody, you come under pressure for that. And then it's hard to get time to go and fix the website. So, okay. So I, you, you took a, you took a nice little jump from, oh yeah, I was in clinch and oh yeah, I'm now a head of TA. I'm a practitioner over here. That's a journey. So what did you learn or what did you kind of what changed your thinking as you became a head of TA when you started to realize, okay, these people I've been selling to and talking to for a long, long time, I now in their shoes, I now understand their challenges. What were the things you saw that surprised you? I I saw the I, I saw what was probably a great frustration for a lot of TA leaders. Everybody has an opinion on how talent acquisition should be done from outside the function. Okay. And totally. some, you know, and you're trying to you're always trying to balance and not be arrogant. And, you know, and and take ideas and try and run through them. But pretty quickly, I did find a lot of them were, you know, a lot of the thinking was a little bit too dated to be very useful. And then you start to churn through the, the time waste on great ideas from outside the function. And I think that is, a, a, you know, a challenge. I can really sympathize with TA leaders. Everybody has an opinion on how recruitment should be done. And there are great ideas from outside the function. Don't get me wrong, but okay. probably they're not, you know, if you're, if you're given a hundred, some of them like anything else are going to work. And some of them are, are, are just probably not worth the effort. So that, that was a frustration. Or well, just very, very specific, like technical micro solutions and not systemic approaches to, hey, this is a weird thing we're doing here. Yeah. Oh, you know, oh, and in such and such, we used uh, XYZ job board and it was amazing. And I was like, yeah, you know, that was five years ago. They're not really at the at the races anymore. Right. Yeah. Or, you know, oh, and this and, and when you start to realize as well, and again, we were 
advertising to receiving thousands of applications a week, hiring in some cases hundreds of people a week because it was a high volume light industrial staffing business. We, you know, you start to see when, when you get to those numbers, like it, it, it does, like every location is different as well, right? So then you start to get into the world of, oh, well, Monster might work there and you'll try it and you get a couple of people in and then you find it, well, it doesn't really. And you start to have to play a much broader game of averages. So I saw lots of tech that I tried and I tried to support people that I, you know, I knew and be open minded to trying technology. But quickly, we got very good at the top of the funnel piece and very quickly we found a lot of the stuff wasn't really going to move the needle. Great idea, but wasn't going to move the needle, right? We got really good at, uh, you know, we used, we used, we partnered with Kelly and Red Dot Media. We got very good at the programmatic top of the funnel piece, getting high volume of applications, making sure the applications knew what they were actually getting themselves into as early as possible. And we got good at that. So it became a case of, well, if I do that thing and employ that, deploy that software, I'm going to get an extra five candidates, you know, a month from that channel. But I could just spend another $50 with Indeed and I'm done, right? Yeah. And that seems like a lot easier. But again, you're always conscious of trying to make sure you have other tools in your armory so as you're not just dependent on one particular channel. So we found a lot of success with Indeed, with ZipRecruiter, but also we found a lot of success with Facebook. And Facebook was kind of like our secret weapon because when the others weren't working or were too expensive, we could roll out our Facebook tools and we built a lot of automation to turn leads into applicants and get them into onboarding very quickly. So we did try to develop, you know, a broad range of channels so we weren't going to ever be beholden to one provider, which would have been foolish. Yeah. So, okay. So you're filling the funnel and you've got a wide variety of kind of means by which to fill the top of the funnel. You're in this position where you're talking about literally a thousand candidates or a thousand applicants per some of these recs. That's a massive amount of information to run through. You and I, in fact, one of the very first things you told me or talked, we talked about that kind of made me go, okay, this guy knows what he's talking about is this idea that the way talent acquisition is structured. You'll get a hundred requisitions to hire one person, which means you've just made 99 enemies. You've just pissed off 99 people and there's no business that survives making 99 enemies for every one customer. And that doesn't make any sense. So how are you kind of connecting those dots? So you can say with that moral view of saying, we don't want to just generate applications just because we can, because we, you know, we, that, that generates more pain than we want. How do we turn that into a proper funnel? And how do we really engage with those people so we serve both sides. I think, well, to your right, that is what happens. And I think when you're on the delivery side, you're getting hammered, get me more candidates. Each site needs more candidates. And it's like, do you want more people or do you want more people that can actually, that want to and will actually do the job? So that's yeah. the, the first half of that. Secondly, I, you know, before we would take on a new location, I would do a pretty in-depth analysis on how easy it was going to be to get uh, candidates. For that location. So I could pretty much forecast reasonably accurately whether a location, if we were looking at, was going to be hard to recruit in, or 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 potentially much easier, and obviously we wanted to, you know, you're being strategic. You want to try and start with the easier locations, build your reputation. One thing I did see that was really interesting, I saw in uh, in uh, in one location, I you know, anecdotally, I saw other bigger employers, you know, who you know, global companies who had literally burned the candidate pool in that area. So they had literally gone through every single uh, every single applicant. They'd hired some of them, they'd fired some of them, but they literally were now in a world where there were just not a, there were no more people that would go through their funnel. And that made me really thoughtful about the whole thing of, you know, how do we get better at turning off jobs when we don't want more applicants? Because I think sadly the operation side is, you know, you know, that applicant in the ATS that you're looking at is like a line and a number, but you gotta remember that was a person who had to go to a website, yep. you know, maybe hard in their mouth because they haven't decided to leave their new job. And I think people underestimate what a big deal it is for someone to apply to make that first apply. And that's what we tried to make easy and clinch. That first apply was name and email, no big long mm -hmm. form, because guess what? If you were teetering about making the application because you're working in Google and you have a lovely job and you really like it, but you're not just sure about your boss, you've if that isn't easy to get to the next stage, once you get them to the next stage, I think it's it gets easier because then the kind of floodgates get open if they're smart, they make multiple applications. But I think people forget what a big deal it is for somebody who, who you know, and you know, that click of the button there, putting their hopes, wishes, wants, and desires all into what might come back from clicking It's emotional. It's, it's meaningful. I don't swear, but it's a big effing deal, right, for them, okay? And uh, so, I, you know, we I thought about that a lot and we, so we, it, the nice thing about Light Industrial, we were really, we were able to accommodate all, all types, right? So 
if you were prepared to show up and do the work and, you know, and you, you had some very minor, you know, educational requirements, we probably could get you a job. Okay. That was the nice thing about it. So we had a very, very seamless way of, Hey, James, thanks for application. Click here to move to the next stage. We'd schedule a call with the team in, uh, the offshore team in Colombia, and we would then, uh, put them through the whole onboarding process, which is actually in staffing is a big piece of the puzzle, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I always think of the tech stack in, you know, that wide and in staffing recruitment is only that bit of it, right? There's yeah. a lot more downstream, getting them on site, paying the bills, getting the bills paid, invoicing the client, MSPs. Like it's a complex world. I have a lot of sympathy for, you know, staffing organizations because they run a very, very broad tech stack. And I can yeah. see why in some cases recruitment hasn't always got the attention it needs because it's a smaller part of the puzzle. Critical, but still small. Quick question. If you could increase the offer acceptance rate by 20%. What would that be worth? Or maybe get 10% more prospects responding to your recruiters. What would that be worth? Or lowering your ad spend and your agency spend by 15, 20%. What would that be worth? I'm going to bet it's worth a lot more than $1,500 a month. And that's how much it costs to build an employer brand, especially when you treat it as a subscription or employer brand as a service. If you wanna learn more about how you can make these kinds of impacts almost immediately, check out employerbrandlabs.com. That's employerbrandlabs.com. All right, let's get back to the podcast. So yeah, that was the, so, you know, and I still think that, I think back a lot. I wrote a blog post recently because we have a new product we've built called Glide. I'm not here to sell that, but we're really interested in the top of the funnel automation, automating the advertising of jobs, the resume review, and the screening of candidates into uh, into the 10% or 15% that could probably actually do the job or get the job. But I, I dug out an old blog. I rewrote an old blog post. It was something I wrote a long time ago. When we were hiring for salespeople in Clinch, I was like, oh, I know, I'm I haven't done a lot of hiring and I have the ad on Indeed and I've got a ton of people are applying. I'm going, how do I figure out who do I want to talk to? So I was like, I scratched my head and I went, okay, I have an idea. So I put an autoresponder in and I said, hey, James, because I knew your first name because I'd asked for your first name in your email and that's all I knew about you at that stage in Clinch anyway. And I said, hey, James, thanks a million for uh, applying to our with our, our sales, uh, sales role with the sales team. Look, since you're going to be spending a little bit of time on the phone, pick up your phone, call this number, leave a voicemail, tell me why you think you'd be a good fit, why you'd like to work with Clinch, and how you'd pitch the product in 30 seconds. Don't waste more than two minutes of your time on this exercise. And then the critical sentence, I'll wait until I hear from you to progress your application, right? And that was it. Wow. And I then ha got six voicemails, interviewed two people, hired one of them. Right. Sure. And, but everybody who didn't uh, leave the voicemail, that was their choice. They couldn't say Clinch didn't get back to them. They couldn't say we were bad people and they went into a black hole. We responded. We gave them a next step and they chose absolutely fairly on their side to opt out of the process. That stage. And I think that's a really underutilized and powerful concept in yeah. terms of how you deal with people. Yeah, you're, you're giving agency and power to the candidate. I mean, it's their life, it's their careers. They get to make these choices. But I feel like in the standard TA process, they are boxed in and said, give us your resume. It must look like this. It must be two pages long. It must be formatted this way. You must do these things. You must do this link to that. Like we've told them what to do and they've become these automatons and it's horrible. And it feels like as a candidate, I'm just going to apply because I don't know what's in, I don't know what's happening. I, there's no transparency. I have no power. I can't go reach out to these people. And here you're saying injecting a little bit of agency into that process changes the math. And frankly, it changes the emotional component of what does it feel like to get look for a job? Uh, yeah, hundred percent. And again, it's like, it's, it's a, it's a sort of a concept we've built into Glide. So in Glide, we do the advertising, we get the applicants, we do a quick resume review, we respond to everybody. We say, Hey James, you could be a great fit because of X, Y, and Z, but there's a couple of areas we'd like to have a chat with you about. And we offer them a, a conversation with an AI recruiter and it allows them to fill in the gaps if they choose to. Mm -hmm. And we see a great uptake. We see a lot more people. We uncover that they had characteristics or traits or skills that were not mentioned on their resume that were previously being overlooked by a recruiter trying to review a resume in six or seven seconds are now actually potentially viable candidates and we're able to surface them. And I think that's a, you know, you think about recruitment. I used to say, 
it's a good thing to help people not apply for you and I've had this conversation. It's a yeah. good thing to help people not apply for jobs they're not going to get. That's actually the best candidate experience of the lot. I used to have this discussion with Jerry Crispin at the Candies. I'd say, you know what the best experience is, Jerry? What? You don't apply for a job you're not going to get. Because anything, the not, if you apply for a job, not getting the job, anything below getting the job is a suboptimal experience. Exactly. Let's exactly. be honest, right? So I think, you know, but at least in this way, we're able to, we're able to help more people uh, get a better shot at the title for want of a better word. And we're also then able to use that data to slow down advertising when we reach those critical mass of people that we know the client needs to make the hire. So we can save people then applying for the job that they're not going to get because it's already effectively closed, which sadly happens a lot as well, right? Yeah, yeah. So effectively, you've extended the funnel forward a bit to say, look, just click the button, give us your name and email, some very cursory information. Maybe it's a resume, maybe it's a LinkedIn profile. Yep. How are you? And then there's this this there's this kind of conversion where you say, "Hey, very interested. I'm glad you applied. This is what we're looking for. Uh, let me know. Like whatever action that takes to say, do you want to continue now that you know more yeah. about the job? But how are you doing at that at scale? I mean, if you're getting a hundred or a thousand applicants to do that, that's a full time job. That's a multiple person full time job just to kind of go through some of that stuff to see what positive traits that candidate has, to see where the gaps are, to, 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 to write a, a compelling or at least a, a, a custom engagement email to say, hey, we saw you have this, but we see these gaps. We'd like to talk about these things. How are you making that happen at scale? So that's where AI comes in. So we're able to do it now, you know, and, and we're able to do it in a better than, let's say, we probably were a couple of years ago. We're able to do it very, very uh one, pretty accurately, two, without any bias, which is important, but three, in a, it, it just feels more human that you're saying, and it's, it's, and you know what, like LLMs are effectively, effectively connection machines, right? So they're mm. kind of drawing all these connections and the, and the way the LLMs work is really like the fact that they appear intelligent when they're only really working on the basis of this is the most likely next word in the sentence is like is bonkers to me but it, that is how they work and they do that we all know that that they they can they are very credible and, and can be quite insightful but they're very good at understanding gaps so they're very good at doing a gap analysis on a resume versus a job description we do quite a bit of stuff behind the scenes to enhance what that uh what the requirements of the job really are because they're not always the ones that are in the job description i learned that in staffing right the job description they were beautiful i wrote them of course they were beautiful but there was other things behind the scenes right that uh that you know that were required that you were not really relevant in a job description but you still needed to have a conversation with the candidate about can you lift 50 pounds and are you like can you really lift 50 pounds all that sort of stuff so there's there's so by being able to then have a conversation with a candidate about a gap about the gaps rather than about just take me through the same process as everybody else because i'm going through a checklist of a structured interview mm -hmm. is way, well too it's way faster so we get people they're done in 10 minutes right so they're not having to give up a huge amount of their time we're not there yet but we will get to when we're done with that we'll get to figuring out how we expose them to if it's not going so well let's say we'll start to figure out what what other jobs can we get them in front of that it could go better for mm -hmm. them for and that's certainly wow. a, bit, a big a big passion of mine is to sort of say well you know what that person's given up some time to have the conversation let's do what a human would be would probably do which is if they had time oh i know someone who's looking for somebody just like that and and you you mentioned you have this thing here that we didn't look for in the job description but it just came up in the conversation it's not what we want but it's actually what's needed for another job mm -hmm. i think that's where ai can do a really good job of making connections yeah I, and what you know if I'm, I'm putting words in your mouth i apologize and tell me where i'm wrong but it feels like this is a system that says not how do i take a pile of applicants, sort through the garbage I don't want and find the good one. Instead, it's about how do I go through each one individually, treat them with some level of respect. Hey, you took the time and energy to apply. Um, you are good. At, you're a great candidate. I want to talk to you. You're not, I can't tell if you're a great candidate. We should have a quick chat or we should have some sort of exchange of information or look, you're not a great fit because of XYZ, but we have these other things. I think that's such a fundamental change in how we think about talent acquisition, where it's not about how do I extract maximum value from a candidate, but how do we have an, an exchange of value? That is sounds yeah. tiny. It sounds stupid almost. It sounds facile, but so much of talent acquisition is about how do I extract value from candidates and give leave the candidates with nothing, not actionable feedback, not direction, nothing helpful. It's all about what can I take from the candidate? And this is a different model. 
Yeah, and I think it's like it's it's certainly you know it's it's candidate first. Uh, you know, we're definitely sort of you know when we you know in in our mission and values and all that, we're very much a candidate first uh, platform. Where because we're always thinking because at the end of the day, uh, you know. And you've alluded to this and you're quite right. There's, you know, by treating candidates better, there's nothing, there's nothing to, there's nothing to be lost by doing that. Yeah, there's right? no downside. You know, What's the downside? Yeah, there's no, there's no, there's no badness going to come from treating candidates, you know, in a more humane manner, for want of a better word, be, rather than, like you said, chucking them all in. Like, we've all heard the stories and this is the truth. You know, I remember a guy once, hey, Shane, I've got to, like, how are you going to figure out? I've, I've a thousand applications for my boss's EA role. Or how are you going to figure out who you're going to pick? And he goes, oh, gee, I don't know. He said, ah, I can't read through a thousand. And he goes, I know what I'll probably do. I'll throw them all up in the air. And the ones that land on the desk, I'll look at those, right? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, you know? we've all heard like, horror stories like that. It's yeah, just so sad. It's, and, it's, and, it's, and it's sad. And it's, and it's like, so, I, and I think it's, you know, and it's, I, again, thinking back to a conversation with a gentleman under a bridge who, uh, in Sydney, uh, and uh, Sydney Harbour Bridge, a guy called Matt Burney, who I think is now at Indeed, but back in the day was with uh, G4S. And he said, I, he, you know, I said, how many uh, people did you reject last year, Matt? He goes, oh, I don't know, 1.6 million, 16 million. I can't remember the number. But I was like, imagine you attributed like even $5 uh, uh, of economic value to the time it took them to make the application. That's a lot of economic waste as an organization you have mm -hmm. created. And you've had to create an equal amount of waste on your side by then getting Processing. rid of all these people, right? Yeah. Uh, and again, OFCCP, OE, EOOP, all that sort of stuff kicks in as well. So it is a burden, right? There's, it's not free. Getting rid of people, even if you do it badly, is not free. There's a cost to it. Mm -hmm. um, I said, and that's never mind the human factor and all those things, all those people that you never got back to or you rejected that were, were unhappy, were sad. It was the last straw because I can tell you in all those 1.6 million rejections or whatever the number is, bad things happened. You yep. were the straw that broke the camel's back that day for that person. And it's sad, but it's true. Mm -hmm. The point or the purpose of employer brand is to help people choose your company as a place to work over other companies. Now put that way, suddenly employer brand doesn't seem so complicated. It doesn't seem so crazy. And it seems like something your company could take advantage of. And it is. Take a look at employerbrand.ing, employerbrand.ing, or employer branding, and you can find hundreds of resources, either free or dirt cheap, to help you understand what employer brand really is, how it really works, how to measure it, how to value it, how to talk about it, how to sell it to your boss. So check out employerbrand.ing for all sorts of employer brand resources to help you take advantage of your company's employer brand. So we were talking before and you told me a very interesting story and I'm going to try and pull it out of you a little bit because, you know, as you enter this staffing firm, you had some ideas of ways that could be done differently. Since you're coming at it from an outsider's point of view, you kind of had that beginner's mindset. You were like asking good questions and why do we do it this way? I know a lot of talent acquisition leaders who would love, who have similar thoughts and it doesn't take long before they're in the same box. Everybody else is doing the exact same way, using the exact same tool sets and the exact same processes. What was what? this trick that allowed you to make real change? And I know the answer to this, but it's going to lead to a better conversation. Yeah, well, like being a significant owner of the business was a big was a big way of getting it done, right? Oh, okay. wow. So having a little yeah. power here. Yeah, so that that, that did help. Uh, I think at the end of the day, though, and that was that was a kind of get over the hump. At the end of the day, it was about data, right? Once I was able to collect some data, and I, once I had better data than any of the anecdotal data I was being fed when I was being asked to do things, that put me in a position of strength that it was very hard to refute. Because I would say, no, we're not going to. We tried that. We did. We, that was a great suggestion. We tried it. It didn't work. It yielded two candidates, and the cost was five hundred dollars per hire, and mm -hmm. our average cost per hire was, let's say, 50 to $100. Like, and, and again, I'm, those numbers are loosely directionally correct, but they're not 100% accurate. But again, so data was then the key to be able to go and say, look, we tried it uh, in there and it's not likely going to work here again. And then this, but we want to do it this way. And again, once you start to perform, and again, I'm 
be, be honest, I was probably off to a bit of a shaky start, hadn't done it before. You're trying to figure out them. And again, light industry is very different if you think about it, to the world of corporate TA. Interesting things. I realized that, you know, the employer branding and the career website, they were less important, James. They, you know, I got people to come to the site, but I kind of was doing the old things of saying, I got to get them to the site. I got them to get to read the job description. Whereas the reality is I didn't. I needed to get them on a call with somebody who could figure out quickly what we do with Glide, whether they could do the job or not, and then get them into onboarding because they wanted to go to work tomorrow morning if possible, right? Yeah. Well, so, and I also, it gave me a great insight as well. And again, back to employer branding, like I still highly value the career site. I still, but I do think that, and again, in Glide, what we've been able to do a lot more is I do think you can use each of these interactions with a candidate to actually tell them what you really need them to know and you don't have to make them go and read the website or you don't have to make them ask the chatbot the questions. So you yeah. can imbue yeah. what you need them to know. And again, it's when I think back, it's nothing I didn't do as a salesperson, right? The art exactly. of the sales is like in giving you, answering these questions before you've answered them, but making that those answering those questions as the conversation unfolds so it feels very natural and you're mentally ticking off all these reasons why you could buy Clinch or you couldn't buy Clinch and I'm answering them before you even ask the question. And yeah. then that meant that, oh, this, this guy might know what he's talking about and yeah, we would like to buy that product. So I think you can do the same in recruitment. If you can answer, um, you know, classic sales line, a good long copy always be short copy because it left no question unanswered in the buyer's mind. Job description leaves every question unanswered in the candidate's yeah, mind. Yeah, and and they're still very long. They still seem to say a lot without saying yeah. anything of value. <laughs> and and as a tiny little tangent, you remain the greatest HR tech demoer I have ever seen. And it's not just my thought. I, I went a demo that I brought in a lot of people to, and we had seen some big, big names. They all, they were like, Oh, this is horrible. This is horrible. And then you showed up and demoed clinch. It was like, it was night and day. It wasn't even close. That's so very it, kind of you. I, honestly, I, it, it, look, the HR tech thing shouldn't work is you need to teach other people how to demo properly, not just to be charismatic, but just to be informative and useful. Just the industry is desperate for this sort of thing. Well, again, what I, th I think back to that, and thank you, you're very kind. I think was one is, I think you probably remember, I always try to tell a story. So there's yeah. always an end game and why you're doing this, right? And I also never, uh, and it's ironic because we're using, Glide is very much a black box product. So we do demos using a deck, which I don't particularly love. And we'll move away from that pretty soon. But Clinch, I never had a deck. I just rolled up. And I, I was able to tell this story. And I think the nice thing is, I think I probably be better at demos now because uh, I now have sat, and it's certainly I'm finding it in the Glide world where we're mostly selling to staffing. The power of being able to look that person in the eye and say, I have done your job and these are the three problems you have and I can fix two yeah. of those very quickly with this is super powerful. So, but yeah, no, I think... In in general, uh, yeah, you get. I think a lot of a lot of demos revolve devolve to banging on about a feature, whereas the feature is not the big picture. The big picture, let's say, of Clinch was let's, I guess, solve the information flow problem. Let's inform more candidates about your organization so they can make better decisions about the jobs they apply for. Right, and these are all the clever ways we can do it. And this is what you get in return. You get behavioral data, so you're you're able to understand that this is. And, and really interesting, like I saw this, James, the nice thing about business, which we did as was I had the data and all the, let's say, hypotheses that I had were all pretty much proven truly. And I saw things like most of our hire, not most, but over 50% of our hires were coming from a subsequent visit that came as a function of me getting them back to the site, sometimes using clinch, sometimes using marketing automation that sat outside clinch. But we saw all these things. So it's suddenly, you, you know, the value that we were creating by having uh, the, the employer branding content there wasn't always apparent the first time, but with good analytics, you could prove that it had a downstream effect. Now, your head gets melted then with attributions because you're trying to figure out, oh, how do I attribute this perfectly? And, I, and that's another, but I, I don't think it even matters if you're having a conversation conversation about attribution in TA, you're doing something right because you already have enough data to even know what attribution is. And it, that becomes a really interesting thing. That's totally fair. So I want to circle back to the, the, the other conversation about, you know, having the power to make these choices. To me, I think the real reason why TA doesn't take these leaps, doesn't take these risks, or at least try something new is because they don't have power to say, I'm going to make a choice, right? They, every, every TA leader is expected, you got to buy an ATS and you got to buy some sort of email system. And of course, everybody has to have a LinkedIn seat and everybody and everybody and everybody. At the end of the day, TA mm. teams are left with 
pittances to say, okay, what's the gamble I'm going to take on this year? Am I going to try a CRM? Am I going to try a branding project? Am I going to try uh, content creation? What am I going to do? But in the end, the box is so well formed, they can't really make real good choices. How, in your mind, having seen both sides of it, what can we do to enable TA leaders to make more interesting choices, not just for the sake of being different or being interesting, but because that's the only way we're going to change and get better? That's a, yeah, that's a tough question. I think like I, staffing is pretty interesting and I'm going to, I mean, the, the reason is why. So one of the things at the moment for in our sales presentations I'm running through is this is the effect this will have on EBITDA. Okay. That's what the model says. Put this thing in and this is going to improve your EBITDA by one to 2% on a branch level. Right. Mm -hmm. That's so I, you know, if, if the ask of TA was here, show me what this can potentially do to my cost basis, to my, you know, to the, uh, our ability to hire, then I think you've got the, the kind of that recipe for, you know, there's a, yes, it introduces accountability. Not everybody loves accountability, but, and it introduces the need to make a choice, but it's okay to make a choice and be wrong. I've made so many choices that have been wrong, but if I didn't make them, I wouldn't know they were wrong and I couldn't exactly. change, I couldn't have changed my mind. Right. Yeah. So people go, Oh, you thought that. Yeah, I was wrong. I changed my mind. Right. You know, That's I was, I certainly changed my mind about the value of a career site in light industrial staffing. I was wrong. Okay. There was, they weren't going to, I could see it with the heat maps. They weren't going to read all my employer branding content. Right. But I could still imbue that same content. I could imbue it throughout the conversation. So I think, yeah, getting it down to sadly the numbers and uh, the value, like I've often thought, James, it's really weird as well. Like staffing is remunerated based on placements, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty much. And salaries. And so like, you know, they often wonder in, 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 in TA teams, like, Imagine, yeah, I am a lowly recruiter doing light industrial staffing and I place a hundred people, but their average salary is, let's say, 40 grand a year. So I've, whatever, I've, I've placed X million worth of, uh, of, 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 of working, of, of workers for the organization or employees, but, or I'm at the executive end and I've only placed four and they're all earning a million each. That's a nice way to level set and benchmark people. I've never always wondered why, why are not our recruitment teams not more incentivized based on the value of the salary that they end up recruiting? Uh, because that ultimately is a very simple way to level the playing field and help them understand the value they're creating in terms of getting people into the organization on the one side. And then I think, of course, like anything else, helping them then that type of model then also because it creates an incentive to do more with less then solves for the other problem of sometimes you know HRTA it was a bit like let's we need more people to process indeed applications it's great I get more people I have a seat at the table versus you know I get more people because I I, I get less people but I'm delivering a more profitable function so I think all those kind of wrap up into the one thing for me and again I'm also a business owner and an operator that's the things I will be thinking about when we ultimately hire a recruitment person to take over recruitment for Glide as we grow the, as we grow the business. Yeah, I'm stunned that recruiting leaders don't talk in terms of EBITDA ever. Like it's just not a, a phrase that I ever hear out of them. To them, it's all mm -hmm. time to fill and it's number of candidates and number of budgets. It's like, no, ultimately all this stuff has to ladder into how does this impact the business and how do you know if it impacted the business? EBITDA went up or EBITDA went down. That is like 98% of how the business mm -hmm. evaluates value. And that's that. It, the fact that TA leaders don't talk in those terms or think in those terms is maybe what's holding them back in a lot of ways. Yeah, well, it's like at the end of the day, anybody who's on a public listed company, that's the number, you know, that is a, a pretty important one when you've got to have your, you know, your, 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 your announcements to the stock market. And if you're able to, you know, if you're able to impact that, and the nice thing in staffing, it's a very easy number to, to, to draw the line. So it gets harder, particularly in, you know, high organizations to do that. But I do think that there's all, you know, and I sat down, last week to start to mod to build a model for staffing so we could have some conversations with some of the with some of the, the the senior leaders now the nice thing is they're in the world of recruitment and it does impact their business so it's easier but i i don't believe that it's impossible to do for any recruitment function like yeah. it might not be as accurate but it's still okay to claim a slice of that success when it happens right and, and if you can't what are you doing what would why are you there that's that to me is the, the ultimate question so as someone who has played in a lot of different sandboxes, you're a business owner, you're a head of TA, you're sales and HR tech, you've, you've done staffing and, and light industrial and all this stuff, you've played in AI. What is 
the thing that's going to change next. I mean, everybody sees AI come and it's like, not, it's not like anybody can miss it, but I think there's so many different perspectives on how it's going to change, how it's going to impact, how we do our jobs. Um, is it going to replace jobs? Is it going to just make our jobs easier? Is it going to make our jobs harder? There's so many kind of, you know, perspectives on the value or the, the challenge of AI. Where, where is your head in terms of what AI is going to do? So I think that, you know, you, when you start to work with it and you get into it and you're, you know, and everybody's using it in day-to-day -day life to do things as well. But I, one of the, I, I guess I always try to come back to like, what, what is AI really, really good at? In the world of, let's say, software, what I think it's really good, and I'm probably phrasing this badly, but it seems to me it's, it's a very nice interface between the structured data of databases and systems, be it mm -hmm. CRMs and ATSs and human beings. It's that kind of like sense. that flexible coupling joint. Whereas before it'd be like dollar first name James, you know, dollar second name Alice, right? Now we have something that can smooth out that structured data to unstructured data piece at scale, okay? And in, so, so, so then the other thing is AI, even if it's not, always perfect it's pretty good at doing what it's asked to right yep. repeatedly and uh, and humans are not always quite as good at that sadly they have good days and they have bad days so that then bringing it into the world of recruitment i think there's a couple of thoughts that i have on it one is i think we're, there's two sides to this there's the automation piece and there's the augmentation piece mm -hmm. i think if i was having to build a TA function from scratch now, I'd probably be going back to my old sales and marketing type approach and going, right, let's break the function down into the different pieces because we know it's better for uh, a researcher to focus on research and then a sales development person to be making the outbound calls and account executive to be closing the deal. So we break it up. I think that's kind of interesting because I think when you break it, when you break that down more in recruitment, you suddenly get to a big swath of it that you go, wow, that's all automatable today right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not the whole, the whole funnel is not automatable at all by any stretch of the imagination. And, and I particularly see this down the bottom of the funnel. I think the, you know, I saw this in Whistler partners where we were high end attorney search, uh, you know, moving attorneys between law firms, placing partners, doing GC and in-house searches that the value of the recruiter there is very much the, the, the interface between the hiring manager and the recruit and the candidate for that last mile. Mm -hmm. James is an amazing hiring manager. He just doesn't come across that way in social media. But when you work from, you're going to love him, right? You know, that type of conversation. Yeah. I think that's the bit that the humans are still, you know, fundamentally going to be very, very good at. Yeah. Uh, but I think a lot, and I, and I, and I think, and can they be made better at that end with augmentation? Yeah, of course they can, because now suddenly they've got, they can now keep, if they're not having to deal with processing applications, writing job descriptions and screening candidates, now they can do a much better job at that end of the funnel. And with a little bit of AI, they can do a better job with more people because they have instant context on everybody because they can suddenly go, I've got James up now, right? Tell me about James. And you can quickly, you know, get a, get a, get a, get a handle on it. So I think that's the real value. So do I think that recruitment numbers will be under pressure downwards over time 100 percent. i, I yeah. think quite a, like quite significantly but do i think a lot of those activities will get pushed towards the bottom of the funnel and people will get better results by spending time at the bottom of the funnel and that's where humans are good at when they're interacting with each other yes i do so i think that's that's kind of the future i don't know i always forecast things as happening way quicker than they actually do that's so i truly yeah. You know, hard, hard to. I know in, in, you know, and again, we brought some stuff from the future into the world of shift fillers because it would have, it could have taken years to get done in an organization. We sometimes would make changes, you know, in weeks or months because we were able to. Um, but yeah, so I, it's not going to be overnight, but I do feel longer term more pressure on the active, the automatable activities that recruiters are doing and let AI handle all that sort of stuff, you know, and put a human check in, even in Glide. If you're not happy with your, with your screen, we're okay. You can have a conversation with somebody. That's that's wow. not a problem. Okay, you know you can you can have have that conversation. I think the the fact of being explaining that you're probably not a great fit for the role because it required five years of sapana and you've no sapana either on your resume or in the conversation generally avoids the need for the human conversation, right? Yeah, yeah, makes it pretty clear why the it makes it clear what the decision is and what the factor yeah. that decision was, and that's super useful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So kind of winding this down if you had a magic wand to change something in talent acquisition what would you want to change what would the, what's the most important change that needs to happen i think trying to enhance that synergy between human 
intuition and the AI driven insights. And it's a bit like back to the whole world of matching that I, I think if you think about my own career, right, I've done multiple different roles. And if you said to me here, Shane, would you, do you think you could do such and such? I, said, I could probably have a go at it and I'd probably be, I'd probably be okay at it. Okay. So I do believe that humans are fundamentally very, very, uh, are very, very, um, capable and flexible across a wide range of things. And they don't always get the benefit of that because they don't have it on their resume. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, I, I think, so I think being able to, you know, that using AI to get more information about the person beyond the resume and then human intuition can, the combination of those two, I think can make it a more holistic and, uh, and, 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 you know, and again, you need human intuition for the cultural fit and, and all those other things as well. Like, yeah. You know, I was ch chatting to Jerry there. Where was I? I must have been at HR Tech. I was sitting up having a glass of wine with Jerry and we were talking about, he was telling me about a program in Argentina where, I think it was Argentina, or maybe it was Brazil, big company. They hire the best people in the world, but you know what they do? They get those people to mentor the year one interns, right? Mm -hmm. And then very quickly they get those year one interns to, the, you know, if you think about it, they jumpstart their earnings yeah. curve. And so when you think about the amount of extra area under the curve by kickstarting them up to this experience level, like it's an, it's the most obvious, easy thing to do in the world. And I don't know the numbers, whether each mentor who's earning 500 grand has five interns or not. I don't know, but it did start to make me think a lot more that, well, you know what? That's what kind of AI can do. AI can be a mentor for everybody in the role. And if the person's smart and they're willing to learn and they're prepared to put the time in, people can get good at stuff a lot faster than they ever ca could have before, right? Because everything is now available about their fingertips. So maybe that's going to be part of this whole world of how we hire, you know, we're less concerned about can somebody use Concur versus how quickly could they pick it up, right? Yeah, totally. So as a, as a last kind of, well, first, you know, before we, we, we close this up, is there a challenge you'd like to give the audience? We're talking to people who are trying to make change. They're trying, they're, they're, they're tired of doing it the same old way, just because that's the way it's always been done. They're looking to make change. Is there a challenge you can give this audience to say, this is how, or this is why you can make that change something. And I'm trying to leave it as, as wide as, and open as possible mm. for you, but what's a challenge you can give people? You know, and I'm sure this has been said before, but I think my challenge to the audience would be to think of recruitment not as an isolated function, but a crucial part of the overall business ecosystem, right? And, Absolutely. you know, I'd urge everyone to consider how integrating advanced HR tech recruitment strategies, how can they positively impact the overall business growth and innovation? And then that's it. You're, you're kind of, you're all done, right? It's not easy, but that's, that's the, that's the step, right? Prove that. Uh, and, uh, and then you have, you know, you have achieved what has not necessarily been achieved before. Totally. I love that. Shane, thank you so much for being here. Can you tell people where to find you? You you said uh, you went from being very very quiet to suddenly being back out in the world. So I'm thrilled by that. By the way, uh, where can people find you? So you'll find me on LinkedIn forward slash in Shane D Gray, and uh, you'll also start to find me on Twitter at Shane D Gray a little bit more, and then lastly, good old Facebook because you know that's where I live because that's that is the best you. place for pictures of sunsets and nice meals or Instagram and, as well. Instagram at Shane D Gray. Yeah, if, if you follow him on Facebook, the best part is the chain of letters that is all the airport codes he's got in a single trip. There are sometimes as many as 17 or 18 stops in a single trip. It's mind boggling. It's, it's amazing. I know. Anyway, listen, you're very good. Great to see you again, James. Great to talk to you and uh, wishing you much success in all your endeavors. Thanks, Shane. Thanks for being on here. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Bye-bye.